the church as the goddess. Previously, we explained how Christ was both male and female, with the female being the church, the body of Christ. Yet as there are no symbols of this, the Virgin Mary was made to represent the church. Woman, why are you weeping? Because they have taken away the divine female symbols. And Mary is only a human being. That the veneration of Mary is more than the veneration of a mere human being will be discussed in another video. Yet another divine female symbol is Lady Wisdom, who is described as ministering in the tabernacle. She is also described as the incense. The tree lamp stand. Being eaten. Therefore, in order to find Lady Wisdom, we should be looking at the church worship service. Enlighten my simple five senses. She is the beauty of the pictures which cannot be seen. But post-Renaissance naturalistic art obscures the attempt to portray inner divine realities. And here the light of the halo appears to be like a normal natural light, whereas the glory of Lady Wisdom, who dwells within us, is not of this world. And the Protestant reformers destroyed church art. The Protestants based themselves on the Ten Commandments which forbid graven images. However, both the Tabernacle and Solomon's Temple had images. Which we should follow has been debated much, but all I can add is a curious quotation from the Dead Sea Scrolls, produced by the Jewish Essenes, whom some have said are the precursors of Christianity. Holy things wonderfully embroidered, multicolored, figures of effigies of holy angels. She is the melody of the chanting which cannot be heard. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, God my Savior. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked.
However, there developed a theatrical element which obscures the attempt to direct the senses away from sensuality and towards divinity. Furthermore, the music of Protestant hymns has no concept of the preparation for seeing God. Yet modern developments have clouded our emotions even more, pushing the divine vision further away. But the Bible talks about praising God with musical instruments and dancing. Yet the type of music used since antiquity is different from pop music. Sentimentality is like a veil between us and God. An atheist could listen to this same song and have identical sentimental emotions welling up inside. This means that such emotions are produced by the song and not by God, even if God can guide us. However, the Bible tells us to be still and know that I am God, and there is a famous hymn about stillness. Yet the emotions produced by this hymn are incredible noise compared with the stillness the Bible describes. While I like singing such songs, and especially carols at Christmas, yet the Bible says that no one shall see God and live. This seems very negative, yet people have seen God and not died. This is because we stop living to become eternal life itself. Some Christians reject chanting because they think it is only vain repetitions in order to appease God's anger, but with this understanding it is actually the opposite in that it points us towards union with God. 
and the music should try to point us towards this divine stopping or stillness which accompanies the divine vision. She is the fragrance of the incense which cannot be smelt. Yet some churches which do still use incense say that it evokes the mysterium tremendum, tremendous mystery, and a feeling of overwhelming awe and solemnity. I can remember being told such things after a church service. My only thoughts were, church is my home, what are you talking about? This lopsided view of divine awe could easily come from the ideas of Anselm of Canterbury. The main reason Christ became man was because the Father was angry with humanity, and could not forgive us until he had vented his anger by killing Jesus in our place. And incense has been linked to calming the anger of this distant God. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. However, the ancient Persian church service has a radically different view of why incense is offered. May our prayer and petition please thee, and the smoke of our pleasant censer refresh thee like the censer of Aaron the priest in the tabernacle and renew our souls with our bodies and be reconciled to thy creation for thy many mercies sake, O creator of pleasant roots and sweet spices. Here the emphasis is on the beauty which still exists in God's creation, for despite our sins, we also are still beautiful to God, who desires to be united with us and the creation, having his glory again shining from within. Yet because the use of incense had been wrongly associated with being made acceptable to the angry God, it was rightly rejected with this meaning in the Reformation. However, the real reality of God visibly shining in us and the creation before the second coming of Christ had been long forgotten. She is the sweetness of the wine which cannot be tasted. In almost all ancient services water is mixed with the wine. This is taken to signify the blood and water which flowed from Christ's side at his death. Interestingly, 
a somewhat enigmatic passage of the Bible is quoted by some at this moment. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth, for there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are one. Yet this verse cannot refer to the blood and water which flowed from Christ's side at his crucifixion because here he did not come by blood and water, but they came from him. And why the emphasis on not only by water? Earlier on it is emphasized that Jesus has come in the flesh because some denied that he was fully human, and here coming could easily refer to being born. So coming by water refers to the waters during childbirth. Coming by blood will refer to the ancient idea that the menstrual blood was diverted into the growing fetus. Hence the emphasis on the blood to imply that he was fully human. Some also said that the body of the fetus came from the father, the blood from the mother being its complement. Of course, Christ's conception was virginal and miraculous. So we have the symbolism of Christ being born in us via Holy Communion, with the cup being like a placenta. She is the sign of the cross which cannot be felt. Surprisingly, some have claimed that making the sign of the cross was known about in ancient Israel. The prophet Ezekiel saw a vision in which an angel was told to mark the faithful with the Hebrew letter Tor. The letter Tor is written like this. Yet in antiquity it was written like this. but it could also be written like this. However, perhaps more surprisingly, some Protestants and Evangelicals have been opposed to this idea. It is clear that there could be no anticipation of the Christian symbolism in the minds of Ezekiel or of his hearers. The text signifies, not a letter, but a mark or sign. It is actually the reverse, the Christians continued the ancient usage of signing with this letter. But we are told that the high priest was anointed with oil using this letter shape. So how could Christians be opposed to making the sign of the cross? It is a hollow gesture. It is superstitious.
it is forcing forgiveness. While even amongst evangelicals there are pious practices which can descend into hollow actions or superstition, yet it is the thought that we can force, or need to force, God to forgive us by performing certain actions or works, like making the sign of the cross, which really offends evangelicals. The Bible clearly says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So where does the idea of forcing God to forgive us come from? It is a divinely revealed truth that sins bring punishments inflicted by God's sanctity and justice. An indulgence, such as making the sign of the cross, is the remission before God of the temporal punishment due for sins already forgiven, as far as their guilt is concerned. So technically God has already forgiven us, but still wants to punish us, Emotionally though, is this really proper forgiveness? This temporal punishment to satisfy divine justice is related to what Jesus talks about when he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Then please can you love me a little less? Whether we view Jesus as loving meek and mild, or always wanting to rebuke us, will depend on the spirituality and ethos of the local church we attend. This is true of Protestant and Evangelical churches just as much as Catholic and other traditional churches. And unfortunately, dogmatizing that God's view of us is split between love and justice does not help. About 70 years before the Protestant Reformation, concerns were raised by the Greeks concerning this attitude of love versus justice. If God still wants to punish us after forgiving us, then talking about a God of love is hollow and vain, but divine love in such matters conquers the idea of justice. It should be noted that there have always been Catholics who have been keen to distance this idea of temporal punishment from a sort of vengeance inflicted by God. Someone once came to a Russian saint, tortured that God might not forgive their sins. Now don't be afraid, the Lord is good, he will forgive all sins, mine and yours, and will grant salvation to us both. This does imply that making the sign of the cross can easily have nothing to do with forcing God to forgive us.
Chi is the beauty of the pictures which cannot be seen. The melody of the chanting which cannot be heard. The fragrance of the incense which cannot be smelt. The sweetness of the wine which cannot be tasted. The sign of the cross which cannot be felt. But all these physical symbols for Lady Wisdom are just that. Symbols and not the reality. Yet Jesus spoke of his death and resurrection as follows, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. He was planted in the ground of the tomb cave. and rose up like the high priest coming out of the cave of the Holy of Holies. The outer garments of the high priest signified the creation, its colors signifying the four elements. Linen was for the earth, being made from plants. Purple wool was for the water, the color was made from sea creatures. Blue wool was for wind, the sky is blue. Scarlet was for fire. and gold thread was for God's glory. Hence, by dying and being buried, Christ united himself with the physical creation. And then by rising, he caused the divine glory to shine in it. Although this is not yet revealed, we seek to worship God in spirit and in truth. To worship God in spirit and in truth is to lay aside the entanglements of ancient ceremonies, and to retain merely what is spiritual in the worship of God, for the truth of the worship of God consists in the spirit and ceremonies are but a sort of add-on. While the Israelites worshipped God spiritually, they were bound to perform ceremonies, which were abolished by the coming of Christ. Thus the excessive multitude of papal ceremonies deprive the Church of the presence of Christ. Hence the presence of Christ is only imagined, as shown in this picture. While divine worship should always come from the heart, yet it is wrong to imagine that this only involves our spirits and not our bodies also, for example, the Spirit of Christ was seen at Pentecost and descended on the bodies of the Apostles. And, contrary to popular opinion, the fire of glory appearing at Pentecost has never ceased. One of the desert fathers raised his hands to heaven, his fingers appearing as ten flames, and he said, If you want, you can become all fire.
and it is by worshipping in the spirit that the divine glory is seen, seen, that is, not with the eyes but with our whole being which partakes of this divine nature. And becoming glorious fire via the sacraments is how we deliver the creation from corruption. We have Christ as the female church. And we enter into her womb via the waters of baptism, which correspond to the waters of childbirth. And we are nourished by her breasts of the bread and wine. In antiquity, breast milk was also thought to derive from the menstrual blood. Disclaimer, this is for healing the creation, not in order to say who is or is not accepted or rejected by God, for example unbaptized infants. Thank you for watching. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Mother Spirit.